Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker formerly employed by British Telecom Sprint. With his health failing, Isaac did the only thing he could think of. He ran. He found a haven in a working class district of the city known as Little Russia. There Isaac took on a new name, Ishmael. Within hours of his arrival, he was embroiled in the affairs of a brutal member of the Mediza organized crime family known as Leo. Convinced by a longtime friend, Frankie, to flee from his commitments to the Mediza family, Isaac found himself hunted by the ruthless Leo. On a rooftop, far from witnesses, Leo murdered Frankie. Only through the use of his skills as a hacker was Isaac able to drive Leo off. Now wounded, alone, and far from help, Isaac depends on the kindness of strangers. What do you do when the only way to save those you love is through the use of proxies? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Proxy by Colby Tracks. 35. We stumbled through the snow. The numbness in my feet turned to pain. Fatima had to know there was a blizzard encroaching on the city. Why hadn't he brought some boots for me? Or given Jakob's shoes to me? I must have spoken these words out loud. Jakob needed his shoes to make his escape. Your feet are unimportant. Fatima answered absently. What if I get frostbite? That could really hurt, I mumbled in response. There won't be enough time for it to do more than cause a little discomfort, Fatima said. We were trudging through foot-deep snow along the deserted industrial district which surrounded the Amazov catfish farms. I hadn't seen a vehicle since Leo had driven past. Ryafri killed three men, one of them from his own crew, barely fifty yards from me. Where are we going? South. Where are all the people? I've never seen the streets this deserted during the day. I said as I tried to keep my mind off my ever-increasing blood pressure. My Bapemapo null was hot against my side, not the blistering heat it had been after I had hacked into the police radio network only a month before, but definitely warmer than it normally ran. I checked the energy use statistics. The port which powered my shunt network was running at maximum pull. The alcohol fuel cell which powered the Opemapo was running at its theoretical limit. Instead of sipping its fuel, the Opemapo was guzzling it at a rate which would drain its reservoir in a little less than five hours. City Center declared a snow emergency. Only essential services. Only essential travel. No non-emergency vehicles on the street, Fatima said. The city shut down by a little snow, I said as we came in view of an elevated train station. The Lakes Districts received over 18 inches last night. The southern boroughs received nearly three feet overnight. The Corps is expected to see total accumulations of up to three feet. Fatima said as he led me up the long stairs leading up to the train platform. Tell your burka, set color traditional black. I did as I was told. A real snow apocalypse, I joked. That's what the media is calling it, Fatima said as we approached the turnstile. Then how are we getting anywhere if everything is closed down? I asked as I waited for Fatima to produce his fast pass. He ran it through the scanner twice. A squeal of brakes, the throbbing rumble of rails and steel wheels filled the platform with the noise of a hundred mechanical dragons. We passed through the turnstile and onto the platform. The trains are essential services. Buses and cars are not, Fatima said as he helped me walk along the side of the train. The train pulled out. That wasn't ours. We need to cross over. I was about to ask when I saw the answer to my question. A pedestrian overpass. Truly just a flight of stairs up, a walkway, and a flight of stairs down, encased in a tunnel of welded grating, was the last obstacle before our train. It took us forever to climb the stairs. My blood pressure was in the red. Metal was in my mouth. I'd give you another sedative, Fatima said as we rested at the top of the stairs. He motioned at the cameras at either end of the bridge between the two platforms. But the authorities wouldn't approve, I think. Though it would get you the medical care you need a bit faster and cheaper than dealing with Dr. Riona. If I might give my professional opinion. What do you mean? I asked as we started across the steel bridge. A train approached the platform we wanted. 
I tried to move faster. Don't push it. Another will be by in fifteen minutes, Fatima said. I was glad he stopped me. By the time I had taken my third rapid step, I was already feeling lightheaded. The train left. I heard the clank of many feet behind and before me. I had to be hallucinating. No train had come to the platform behind us. Fatima held me up as we continued our crossing. Keep your head down and act subservient, he whispered. I lowered my head and tried to figure out how I could look more subservient than I was now. The sound of leather-soled shoes approached us rapidly from behind. The squeaking sound of rubber on metal approached leisurely from ahead. I felt a rough hand on my arm. Where do you think you're going? A gruff voice I recognized barked. I turned my head to see the scowling face of David glaring at me. I panicked. My body began to shake. My Opemipo null flashed warnings about critical thresholds being passed. I found I had lost my voice. Fatima held me tighter and said in his softest voice, I am afraid you have us at a disadvantage. Damn straight I have you at a disadvantage. Don't pull the, don't hurt us, we're just women, angle, doc. David laughed. How did he know? I am afraid you're mistaken, sir. Now if you would just let us pass, I would be most grateful, Fatima answered. David grabbed my hand and pulled it roughly. Odar, does this look like the hand of a lady? A scarred face peeked around David's shoulder and pretended to examine my hand. Looks like a guy's hand, if you ask me. I told Leo the fairy doc was part of this, but would he listen? No, he wouldn't, David sneered. If you ask me, he was a bit too fixated on the Kwaya family connection, <laughs> Otar said. Fixating on using his gun and not his head, if you ask me, David said. I felt Fatima shaking next to me. He'd counted on being ignored under his burqa, not on someone guessing he was involved. What gave us away? Fatima asked. What was he doing? Playing for time? Time for what? Then I realized I couldn't hear the rubber-soled steps anymore. Other than paying a late-night call on Sergio right before all the excitement? You know the night. The night you performed a little procedure on Nona? David laughed. Really, Doc, I never thought your type approved of abortion, much less performing them. I turned and stared at Fatima. His body language showed David had gotten close to something true. Fatima shook his head. There was no abortion. You don't know what you were talking about. You were just like your father, a foul man with no respect for others. At the mention of his father, David's face became livid. He drew back his hand and slapped Fatima hard enough to shift his burka sideways. A voice interrupted from behind me. I am sorry to interrupt, as it is not my business. But is it really necessary to strike a woman? David's eyes flew from Fatima to a place over my shoulder. I turned my head and saw at least half a dozen men of Chinese ancestry blocking the way toward the far platform. That is no woman, David snapped. It's the fairy Muslim doctor. Fatima is known to us, the speaker said. He is well regarded among the Yin Zi Long. He took a bullet out of me last year. Good doc. We like him. I turned back toward David and Otar. Otar's hand was reaching for something inside his jacket. David released Fatima. Fatima guided me through the mass of rough Chinese men. The Yin Zi Long leader spoke softly. Tell your friend to keep his hands outside his coat. Wouldn't want to do anything the local Jing Sha would want to investigate especially with you two being a bit on the white side for our neighborhood. Otar glanced at David. David nodded and stepped back, away from the gathering of Yinzi Long. The cops are all the same, always back in the locals, even when they are wrong. Not always. Only when the Wago Ren are acting stupid, the leader of the Yinzi Long taunted. I saw David's temperature rise, but he held himself in check. This is at the end of it, Fatima. Or should I say, Muhammad, Jordania? We know where your family lives. Fatima clenched at the sound of his own name. His grip was like iron. I found it hard to breathe. Fatima turned to speak, but the Yinzi long leader spoke first. And we know where you live as well, David Shakava. Or should I say, David Mogilevek? Oh yes, we know that story as well. 
Is it true your mother likes Ukrainian cock? Fatima whispered in my ear. We should leave. They could be at this for hours. I heard a scuffle on the bridge behind me. I turned enough to see Otar guiding David toward the stairs and away from the Yinzi Long. David looked fit to be tied. We made it down the stairs in time to catch the next train. I had no idea where we were going. All I knew was that we were going far away from Leo, David, and their goons. As we took our seats on the nearly empty train, all I could think about was what David had said about Fatima. No, not Fatima. Mohammed Jordania. Did Mohammed really abort my child? Was this the debt he thought he owed me? What the hell was going on? Firmware Proxy is the second book in the Firmware Pentology. That's five books, if you must know. It begins moments after Firmware Hijacked ends. So if you haven't heard or read Firmware Hijacked, this would be a good time to head on over to colbyjack.net and either download the podcast on the audio side, read the episodes on the visual side, or download the Colby Jack Sunday Reader issues 1 through 20 in your choice of either EPUB or Mobi. Firmware Hijacked and Proxy are both available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, amazon.com, and Barnes and Noble. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C O L B Y T R A X. I'm the only one. A complete audiobook version of both Firmware Hijacked and Proxy is available for download through our shop as well. If you don't need any stuff, but would like to support our work, drop on by ColbyJack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located on the right hand side of the blog roll. If you're on a smaller screen, the button will be found at the bottom of the page. Firmware Proxy is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike, 3.0 license. Do what you want with it, just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast, while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. If you want to get social with me, I do mostly Twitter. So if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm Colby Tracks. Spelled the same as above. C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. We could sing that all night long. Thank you once again and have a wonderful week.